Hello, everybody. This is Kathy. I don't know if you can. Oh, and here's another person. This is Kathy. I don't know if you can see me or not, but this is your uh, weekly uh, installment of Writers at Work. We have um, uh, Katie Ranklev uh, with us today. She is a former student of mine from when I taught in the MFA program at University of Pittsburgh. And she's here to talk to us about self-publishing. So we're gonna just go ahead and get right into it. Um, can you show me the next slide, uh, Katie? Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. Sometimes, yeah. yeah I do. Some, sometimes it um, is slow and you have to hit those little arrows in the bottom rather than okay. on, your, on your computer. Okay. So uh, as always, remember that we, um, uh, archive all of these on uh, Cardinal, the Cardinal Direction site at the address that you can see there, including the takeaways document that we will uh, pass out about halfway through. Um, the schedule is also available there and the video of this presentation and you can check out Katie's bio and see who's coming next. Uh, next one, Katie. So actually our next one, I went ahead and put it at the top. This is, uh, we'll go back to being on Wednesdays uh, next week. And so on Wednesday, the 16th of February, we'll have Angela Jackson Brown and Sarah Hollowell, a Ball State faculty member and a Ball State um, English department alum talking about finding an agent and an audience for your book because they just had books come out this year. And so that is something that's very much on their mind. Um, and the students in my class, you'll be reading uh, for next week, the chapters in the Friedman book that are all about this. So next slide, Miss Katie. And remember to share what you learn uh, either during the uh, event or afterwards. Uh, please use the hashtag if you remember BSU Writers at Work, you can tag the Creative Writing Program, tag me, you can take, tag Katie. Um, she's also on Twitter. I love Very to rich. see your tweets. I really love to see their tweets afterwards. It's like the thing I look forward to most each week. That's kind of pathetic, but I really do look forward to that every week. So next. Okay, so before Katie gets started, I wanted to say a few things. Um, one is that the way that I make, like I said, I met Katie when she was a student in my class at the University of Pittsburgh and she was actually studying uh, creative nonfiction at the time and she was writing a book about being a female rugby player. And that means that she is a badass. And that's one of the reasons that I love her so much. Um, one of the reasons I wanted to give you a little context about why I invited her and um, other than her being a badass uh, and that, that I know her, um, one of the things I, I was interested in with her work back then was the the, the way that writing a story about sports is, it's a really good way to talk about gender. And that's a lot of what she was writing about then was about gender and about being a woman. And I also think that writing um, just in the same way that sports stories allow us to write that kind that uh, write about that kind of subject matter, so do romance stories. And that's actually the kind of, of story that um, Katie is self-publishing now are romances. You're probably not really used to um, your creative writing classes being uh, talking ab overtly about genre fiction. If you've had me, th then you know that I actually let my students, especially in my novel writing class, pretty much write in whatever genre they're interested in. That's not always true of all creative writing professors. And just so you understand, the reason for that is that it's really like sometimes when students want me to read their high fantasy novel, I've never read a single high fantasy novel in my life. And so in some ways, I'm not really able to help students when they're writing in a genre that I have never read before. So that's a big reason why a lot of professors sometimes say they don't want genre fiction is for that reason. But when it comes to what you decide to write as a professional writer, I don't care. It doesn't matter to me whatever you want to write. I think that it's all wonderful and it's all good. And so I wanted to make sure that was um, made clear. And I also wanted to say we we also don't talk much about self-publishing in creative writing programs. 
And, but the thing that I wanted to remind you of, and the reason I have this up here is that you remember two weeks ago when Joe Chrisman was here, we talked about trade, university, and small press publishing. And I told you a story, if you could move to the next slide, I told you a story um, off the record about a student of mine who had, I think, gotten ripped off uh, because he did not want the, quote, stigma of self-publishing, didn't want that. And so let somebody else do all of that, except I think, uh, and this is going back to some of the, the slides that I was using for that uh, two weeks ago, basically like wanted somebody else to worry about everything between author and consumer, wanted somebody else to do all that kind of work. And if you go to the next slide, they also wanted somebody else to take care of everything between content creation and getting it in the hands of consumers and readers. And the, the, but the truth is, as I showed you that that student that I was talking about, basically I think got ripped off because the person that was calling themselves a publisher was basically just taking their stuff, formatting it, putting it on the internet, the end and taking a huge chunk of the profits. And what, she's, what Katie's gonna talk to you about tonight is what happens when you do that for yourself, you get over the thinking that as long as that somebody else has to kind of pull the plug or push the button and do the formatting, and then it's somehow more, um, it's more real or more legitimate. And I think that understanding what uh, is possible through self-publishing will help prevent you from getting ripped off. Because if there's one thing I've learned is that when people feel shame about something, that is, you are ripe to get uh, ripped off. And so if you feel shame about, you know, uh, publishing something yourself and you're like, I'll let somebody else do that. Well, that's just a recipe for disaster as, as far as I'm concerned. So that's all I really wanted to talk about. So I'm gonna let Katie take it from here and uh, let me know if, uh, I, for whatever reason, I can't see the, um, the chat, let me do this. I did want to ask one question before we get started. Oops, that's the wrong question. That was the graduate's degrees in creative writing. Katie had one question she wanted to ask you. And if you don't mind answering this question, I'll share the answers with her. And the question is, have you ever read something that was self-published? Just an easy question. So what we're seeing now is I'm seeing lots of yeses and only one no. So there's your answer. So yes, lots of these students have read things that were self-published. Okay. Okay. Well, thanks for that uh, introduction. So it's about 85%. Um, when I started doing this, I don't know that I was aware of having read anything self-published. Um, like Kathy said, I got my MFA at Pitt in 2008. And since 2004, I have worked as a writer. So I was either doing freelance writing. I was, I did a lot of nonprofit communications. And um, most recently I joined the marketing and communications team at a university. And um, what happened was in February, 2017, I came home one afternoon and it was raining inside my kid's bedroom. Uh, we had an ice dam on the roof. If you don't know what that is, you can look it up but I needed $3,000 to fix the roof. And so, you know, I was thinking, how can I get $3,000? And a friend of mine said, oh, you should, you should publish something. You should publish something on Amazon and sell it. And I said, I, I don't think I can do that. I don't write fiction. I write, I write these wonderful stories about women and sports and healthcare. Um, and my friend was like, well, why? Why can't you just write fiction? You have an MFA. And I thought, oh, I have to take it. <laughs> classes with Kathy Day. I've taken all of these form and function classes. I, I, in fact, have an undergraduate and a graduate degree in writing. And so I gave it a shot and I started to write some fiction and I really had no idea at all what I was doing. Um, I was motivated by this potential goal. I needed the $3,000. Uh, so I started reading all kinds of things on the internet, like how can I quickly sell writing and make some money. Um, and what I discovered was that romance was the best-selling genre that was out there. And I was at the time reading and enjoying romance. 
I had always sort of turned my nose up at my mom for reading romance. Um, and then I actually started reading the books and enjoying them and really enjoying this notion that I could sit down with a book and know that everything was going to turn out okay. Um, and so I thought I would try and tell a few of those stories. And there are a lot of ways to self-publish things online and I understood none of them. So I thought I'm just gonna pick one place and try and sell there. And when I, when I keep going, I can try and figure out some more ways. Um, and what I did learn early on is the difference between self-publishing and vanity publishing. Um, there are small vanity presses where people pay to have their works published. And really you're just paying to have somebody format your book and print it um, and put it up for sale for you. Um, I, I do not pay anyone to publish my work. I do all of that. And then the customers buy and read the books. And my goal is to make it so that my stuff is indistinguishable from something that would have been published by another publisher. So um, I want it to look and feel as if it is just the same as any other book. Um, so to get there, I decided I was going to start out with Amazon because they make it really easy. Um, they have a program called Kindle Unlimited. I don't know if you've heard of it. Um, with Kindle Unlimited, the reader can pay a fee per month and read as many books as they would like that are enrolled in that program. The catch for the writer is uh, you get paid per page that someone reads. So if someone opens my book at the time and read five pages of it, I would get that per page rate every month. It ended up being like half a penny per page, usually, sometimes a little less. Um, but the catch is that you cannot sell your book anywhere except for Amazon when you're enrolled in Kindle Unlimited. And even if somebody pirates your book and sticks it up for sale somewhere else, Amazon has very, very good scrapers going around the internet and they will shut, shut, they shut people's accounts down all the time. So I decided to start out um, in Amazon and I had I was writing these fiction books for the first time. I had terrible covers. I did not know how to market them. And it, as it turns out, I was not earning the money I needed to pay for the roof. Um, we took out a loan. I needed to pay that back, but that bought me a little bit of time. And I, I very much did not view this as real writing at the time. This was strictly for me a way to earn money. Um, that was where my head was at the time. Um, so I keep saying I didn't know anything about self-publishing. What was it that I didn't know? Um, all I knew was how to make the book itself. I did not know how to make a cover. I didn't know anything about typography on the cover or the types of images to put on a cover or how to get permission to have an image to sell on a cover. I didn't know how to format. I didn't know how to write the blurb on the back of the book, the, you know, the couple paragraphs about the story. I focused on long form creative nonfiction so I, I didn't know any of that. I did not know how to price my book. Um, I didn't know if I should put it on sale, like a bargain every now and then. I didn't know any of that. I didn't know how to distribute it. I didn't know how to acquire an ISBN. Um, in the United States, you have to pay a lot of money for those. In other countries, they're free. Um, and I didn't know how to market the book or make people aware that there was a book out there that they might like to buy. Um, later on, I also realized I didn't know anything about foreign translations or how to do audio. Like there is just a deep sea of things that I did not know. Um, but there I was needing to learn it. Um, so why did I why did I go down that avenue? I knew that I could get seventy percent of my royalties for every title that I was sold. I could keep seventy percent of that. And I would have total control over everything. I would be able to have final control over the content. I would have total control over the image used on the cover, the title of the book. You know, as somebody who was working as a writer, I very rarely had input on my headlines of my articles. And I would not have final approval over the text. And sometimes editors made choices that were upsetting for me. Um, so I, I wanted that control and needed it to be fast. The cycle of traditional publishing can be a year, two years, even longer from when you write the book to when it is for sale. And as I've said repeatedly, I needed that roof money. So I decided to go about this self-publishing. Um, 
And what I learned from reading in the genre was that uh, people like their books to be in a series. So I was like, all right, I can do this. I can tell a story in a series of three books. And so what I began to do was map out this three book series and write it in between all the other things that were happening in my life. And I started studying covers. I started, um, I did not have money at the time to pay an editor, but I had all these friends from my MFA program and I swapped manuscripts with them and I did critiques and I, you know, I traded my time for their time. And by the time I had things ready to go. I was pretty confident. You know, you've probably, I'm assuming many of you have taken a writing workshop. When you leave the class, your writing is much improved. And I had reached a point where I felt like my writing was ready to go. And so I released them for sale one month apart, exclusively on Amazon. And people started to buy them. And I was pretty excited about that. Um, and I want to sort of talk a little bit about what I meant when I say that I studied the market all throughout while I was writing it. Um, what that means for me, I'm going to try and move this uh, screen share panel. There we go. So I would visit all the different book retailers websites and I would study their bestseller charts in my genre romance. And overall, I would look at what is the price people are charging for these best-selling books I would look at the covers. Are they illustrated? Did they have man chests? What were the color schemes like? Bright, dark? I would study all of that. And then I would go down and I would look at the product pages for each of the books in the top 100 um, in the genre and overall. I would look at the blurbs. Were these in first person, third person? Are they full of questions, short, punchy dialogue? Are, you know, what tense, present tense, past tense? I would look at all of that. If you don't want to do all of that work, there's a, a guy from a company called Klytics, and he does all this analysis for you. I've reached a point now where I pay for this type of analysis, but in the beginning, I was doing it all on my own. Uh, the day that I built this slide deck, these were the top three books in the Amazon Kindle store. So these, all three of these are romance, and you can see they look really different. So there isn't one way that best-selling books look. Um, but I still, it's still a valuable exercise for me to go through and look at the kinds of things that are happening in the books that are the best-selling books. Um, I was able to look at the type of titles, whether they were punchy sentences, one word with a subtitle, like I was able to just study all of these elements. Um, I do not share my pen name with people uh, unless they are readers of romance. And the reason I do not share my pen name is because it will mess up my data. If you would, if you are not a regular romance reader and you go out and you buy my book, it's going to mess up what is called my also bots. So when you look up a book's page on Amazon, you know, you see the cover of the book, the description of the book, the very next thing beneath your book, those are paid ads. It'll say um, products related to this. Those are people who are paying for their uh, book to show up on your book's sale page. But then beneath all of that stuff, and then Amazon tinkers with what they call this, um, most days they call it readers who enjoy your book also bought. This particular day they were calling it explore similar books. But so, you know, I had this three book series and it was a romance book. And what I learned was that people who bought my book were also buying these books. This is page one of five books that people who read my book were buying. And my goal was for them to all look similar, for my book to look like it fit in with those books. So you can see people who bought my book really like Olivia Hale and this person named Serenity Woods. And people who bought my book really like it when there is a dude on the cover in a suit, sometimes touching his chin. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I wanted my book to look and fit in with that. I wanted my data to really reflect that if you see my book and you like books with dudes touching their chin in a suit, then you will like my book. So that was all part of the marketing. And then um, if you can see on the right, these are um, comp authors. So anytime that you are looking at a book's sale page, this is from Amazon, um, there's a circle to the left of the book and it says, here's this author. And below it, it'll say customers also bought items by. 
my goal was to have all of these names here be romance authors, which these are. Um, so if you were to click on Raylan Marks or T.L. Swan, what you would find is a lot of books with dudes in suits often touching their chin, right? So readers who like this kind of book, I would want them to signal to them that my book is going to fit right in and it's going to be something they like. And I have, I only have a couple of seconds to signal that to them through my cover. Um, and Katie, so, yes, this is Kathy. I feel bad now that I'm sure that when I bought some of your books, I screwed yeah. up. I screwed all this up for a while. And I, I, I say thank you um, for giving me your pen name so I could buy your books, which I enjoyed yeah. very much. Oh, thank you. That is okay. Um, every now and then an odd person going out and, and buying my books is not going to mess up my data. But if 20 of you after class were to um, even be clicking around in there, I, I just don't want to risk it. I'm not like super secretive about it, but yeah, don't buy my book unless you're a romance person. They're at the library. You can get them there. Um, so what happened was, you know, my series was starting to sell my men on the cover, clutching their chin in the suit. Actually, he's adjusting his cufflinks, but, uh, I started to shift my mindset. I got to the point where we paid for the roof and that felt really good. And I was really enjoying writing these books and I was really enjoying learning about what it took to sell these books. And I started to think of myself as an author of fiction, um, and so I started to take it a little bit more seriously. I still had my day job. I still had my three kids. Um, this writing these books and figuring out how to sell them was the joy in my life. It is such a high to write a book and have people buy it. Uh, it was amazing. So around this time, I went out, I start, I bought photo editing software and took tutorials and learned how to make a cover. I've reached a point now where I hire a designer to do that. Um, but again, at this time I could afford the software and the tutorials and make my own covers. So I did that. You have to buy each of the images that you're going to use. You have to buy the fonts that you're going to use. And some of the fonts you have to buy one letter at a time. Um, so I had to buy all that. I bought software to learn how to format my books so that when you or someone opens my book on their Kindle or other device, that it looks just like they would expect a book to look. Um, I started studying ads around this time. I really started thinking I could, I could advertise my books. Um, I've used some acronyms here. I'll talk a little bit about those, uh, resources in the takeaway guide that I made, but I started doing ads on Facebook and on Amazon. I also bought a mailing list service so that if somebody read my book and felt inspired to give me their email address, I could periodically send them a message and say, Hey, I have another book coming out. You might like it. Um, and I had to, I took some classes on how to send these kinds of, do this type of email marketing. Cause that is a whole new world. I knew nothing about as well. And like I said, I really began to think of myself as an author. I wasn't, I, I realized that I was doing the work. I was writing these novels. I had, I didn't have an editor, but I had this editorial process. I, and I had feedback from readers. Um, and so that was a really kind of pivotal shift for me. And then I ran into some speed bumps. Um, so the first thing that happened, this is a cover. This was one of the covers that I designed. I've taken my name off of it. Uh, what happened was I wrote this book. I released this book. I started to pay to advertise this book. And I got emails from Amazon that this cover was too explicit and I was not allowed to advertise this book. And, you know, I've seen way racier things on Amazon, but what was happening was I was paying, I was paying for these ads and they were putting a little black box there and it was just like throwing money down the garbage can. And so I actually reached somebody on the phone, which if you've ever tried to contact a human being at Amazon, like that was a whole feat. And I was like, what is too explicit about this book? I've seen worse. Can you tell me? And it turns out they have a rubric for what makes a cover explicit. And the, the boxes that this one ticked are that he is, the people are horizontal. Uh, they said, this is obviously a bedroom. He is not wearing a shirt and he is making what they described as a sensual expression. And so because of all of that, I was not able to advertise this book with this cover. And then soon after I, I got the same treatment from Facebook, they pulled all my ads from there. So I was out all this money 
I have this book. I thought the book was really good, uh, but I couldn't, couldn't sell it. Um, another thing that happened right along this time is something that I call Houseplant Gate. Um, the, my books are fiction and I referenced a business. There's a, there was at the time a real life business called Houseplant Hospital and it was in Swarthmore, PA and their whole business model was if you had a, like a wilting houseplant, you could drop it off and he would nurse it back to health. And that was his whole business model. And he was on Main Street in an expensive town. And I remember seeing that and thinking that has to be a front for something illegal. So in my book, <laughs> in my book, the houseplant hospital was a front for something illegal. And I do not know how this man got hold of this book with the explicit cover that wasn't allowed to advertise, but he got hold of it and reached out to my pen name. I should mention I had a pen name. Um, I was, you know, I was working in a university. I had these kids. I teach college classes. It just felt uh, like I needed that distance to have a pen name. So he reached out to my pen name and he was like, this is my intellectual property. You're profiting off my intellectual property. And I was like, well, I'm well into the hole on this book. So I'm not actually profiting, but that isn't the point. And when you are self-publishing, you take on this responsibility. Um, it, it was my responsibility to know the types of real life businesses that I can name drop. You know, when you have an editor, an agent or something, I guess I'm assuming that they take care of that for you, but they do. As, they do. Yeah. As a self-published person, I, um, I, I was just swimming alone in the sea and I had to contact a, a copyright lawyer. Um, and that was not ever anything I imagined myself doing. Um, turns out the name is not proprietary. There's a number of businesses called Houseplant Hospital. Um, I would have probably been okay, but I was advised by this lawyer to change the name of the business in the book um, and, and not to um, engage in any further communication with this man. So I did not. Um, and then, you know, I was also getting Rocky also bought data and the, like, the couple people that bought this book were messing up my data. Um, it was just, it was very bad. And I was spending more than I was earning on this series. Um, right around this time, there was also something happening called Cocky Gate. I've put a link to a Vox article in our, in the takeaway document. What happened was this romance author named Felina Hopkins decided she was going to file a trademark for the word copy, uh, cocky. And so nobody else was allowed to use the word cocky in their book title or put it on the cover of their book in any way. And this became a lawsuit. Uh, a lot of authors received cease and desist letters. And you know, if it's not just so easy to change the title of your book, you have to buy a new SBN number with the new title. You have to pay your cover designer. In many cases, you're having to re-download and purchase the fonts one letter at a time. And also it's like ridiculous to think that somebody could trademark a word. Um, and what happened was the Romance Writers Association of America, they have a lawyer. So the, the people who were impacted by this were able to engage the RWA lawyer who had to go to court about this. And uh, in the end, reason prevailed and people could keep using the word cocky, but it was a thing that happened. Um, I am now in a professional organization called the Alliance of Independent Authors. It's not genre specific. And they have lawyers on staff who can handle and respond to these sort of things. Um, I'm actually engaging their services right now there's a lawsuit about audible books. That's a topic for another day, but if you felt inspired, you could look up audible gate. Um, and that is a thing that's happening. And the Alliance and their legal team is helping to deal with that. So it wasn't all potholes that at that time, I was having some wins as well, mostly with that first series I had done with the man suits touching the chins. Uh, the book was selected by Kindle to be the deal of the day. So they put the book at 99 cents. And when Amazon puts the power of their algorithm behind your book and works it for you, the results are astonishing. Uh, so I don't know if you've ever received an email from Amazon, but if you're somebody who reads books, the, they, they are constantly emailing you about the deal of the day. They'll send you push notifications on your phone. So they were doing that to like all the millions of people. 
And the same book was selected to be in prime reading in the United Kingdom and Australia. So that, you know, was amazing. I started getting fan mail from like other moms who would say that they were staying up late to read my book, which as a mom, my kids never slept. They still don't sleep. Like the idea of a mom giving up her sleep to read my book was like the best compliment I've ever, ever gotten. And I started getting reviews and I was able to enter this creative flow state and I was meeting other authors and I was earning money. I had more than paid off the roof. So there was a lot of really big wins. Uh, and one of the most fascinating wins for me was because I was doing all of this myself, I, I had all my own data. So I was learning about my audience and the kinds of readers. And when you advertise on Facebook, they give you so much information about the kinds of people who click on your ads. And I learned that the people who click on my ads and go buy my books also own crock pots and shop at the Dollar Tree. And I have a crock pot and I love shopping at the Dollar Tree. Um, so I loved just like knowing that about my audience. I love how granular you can get. So now if I advertise for, I don't have to just type romance writer in as a keyword or something for my ads, I can advertise to people who like crock pots and I have it on good authority that they uh, will also like romance novels. That's, this is when I, I noticed what you, what was going on. Cause you started sharing your good news. And then I was like, aha, this is when I first got the idea. I might invite you to do this just so you know. Thank you. Well, and then, so this screenshot was from uh, the day, a, a recent day where I had put that book for free. And so the book, it was listed at number eight in the entire Kindle store across all genres. It was number one in contemporary romance. It was number two in literature and fiction. It was number two in romance uh, in the Kindle store. And by this point, I had gotten, you know, over 600 reviews on the book and they were pretty good reviews. So I was, I was feeling really good. Um, and I was starting to suspect that maybe I was earning a little bit of money doing this, but I was lousy at record keeping. Um, you know, again, with self-publishing, you're doing all of it yourself. My husband is a CPA and I was like, oh, hey, I think I am earning some money doing this. And he was just like, well, you can't think it, you have to know it. And so he gave me this terribly complex spreadsheet that I began to have to fill out. And I, I hate that element of self-publishing. The rest of it, I all find really invigorating, but the record keeping is terrible. Um, so I, I started to work on this record keeping, but along the way, I started realizing how amazing the romance author community is. I don't know whether you know that Stacey Abrams writes romance under a pen name. And so, you know, in the last senatorial election, she was helping with the runoff election in Georgia and a bunch of romance authors got together and put together an auction and raised half a million dollars for the runoff election in Georgia. And I loved being part of that. I love being part of a movement in the romance genre that really emphasizes consent on the page. I love writing in a genre that centers women and their pleasure and their success and women's friendships and their goals. I love all of those aspects of being a romance writer. Um, so I was like really, really feeling into it in around 2020. Um, and so also at the same time, you know, the fans of this email newsletter started asking me to write books about certain characters. I decided to do an audio book and I met this really cool narrator and we work, we've worked together now for five books. And sometimes he calls me and he says like words from his own head instead of words that I wrote for him to say. And I'm like, oh, it's startling for me when he will call and use his own words. But um, so I, I started learning all this different stuff about audiobooks. I started learning how to sell books in other countries. Um, I rebranded that series that had had that um, explicit cover. I gave it a new cover and new titles. And I started to sell that because I could advertise it. And then the pandemic hit. Um, right when the pandemic hit, I decided to invest in a comprehensive class about ads on them, how to study the data and really the data is what um, helps with everything. You know, and I was homeschooling all these children and parenting and, and working from home myself. And I was working 
for a university so it, for their communications. And since the pandemic began, if you work for university communications, you were just communicating about a pandemic. So I was spending dozens of hours a week studying all this grim stuff, writing about all the like new protocols, spit in a tube, get your vaccine. And it was just sucking away my soul and writing these fiction books was my only joy. So I finally managed to complete this spreadsheet for my CPA and show him that my, uh, my royalties were in fact more than what I was earning in my day job. Um, I, by the time 2021 came around, I reached a place where I just could not write a single other email about get your vaccine. And so a financial goal once again was like really driving me with my self-publishing there I, at this point, I was really loving keeping the 70% of my royalties. I was loving learning about how to sell paperbacks and getting a large portion of the earnings on my audio as well. Um, so we realized that I was, you know, out earning my day job. I was able to leave my day job and I am a full-time self-published author, which is amazing. It's super amazing, you know, but it's also, it's a ton of work and it is a ton of pressure. Uh, and it's really different than the type of work somebody would have to do if they were, um, with a traditional type of publishing. Um, but there's always still more to learn and do. Like I have goals this year. Uh, a couple of months ago, I don't know how many of you were on Facebook, but Facebook was down for like two days. And that really shook me a lot because Amazon could go down like just like that. And a hundred percent of my income was tied into this Kindle Unlimited, um, well to Amazon. 70% of my royalties were coming from Kindle Unlimited and the other 30% were either from paperback or uh, audio. So I decided I needed to pull out and be available, like have more sources of revenue. So I pulled all of my books out of Kindle Unlimited and I put them onto Barnes & Noble, Apple, Kobo, libraries, all these other places. Um, but the problem was I didn't have readers who were used to buying books. I primarily had readers who read them as part of a subscription. So I had to really start from scratch and learn how to find readers who want to buy books. Um, and it turns out they're out there. They are all over the world. Um, I have been finding them. So I've been meeting these goals of mine to broaden. And um, this year I'm focused on learning how to market my audio better. I also want to learn and understand TikTok because you probably know that TikTok sells books. Book talk is a thing and I want to understand it and see if that can be for me. And I, I'm also at a place where I want to study foreign translations. I actually think I might become a bit of a hybrid author and um, I am seeking an agent for the foreign rights to my work. Because while I get excited about doing all of the work for the English language parts of self-publishing, I don't know anything about Portuguese or Portugal. And uh, I'm, I'm thinking that I've reached a place where I'm happy to uh, relinquish some of my royalties for foreign translations. So that's where I am. That's been my journey. Um, Kathy asked me to sort of show a little bit of behind, underneath the hood. Like what, is, what does it actually look like when you're self-publishing? What is my typical day? The first thing I do immediately when I wake up is check how many books I sold yesterday. Um, I, don't, I don't understand why you wouldn't do that. Um, and because I'm self-published, I have access to all this information. I know that some people only find out like quarterly how often they how many books they sold. Like I, I can find out every hour. Um, how many I, books did you sell yesterday, Katie? Oh, well, I don't like know off the top of my head. I, I, okay. I, I daily, I, I, I have a daily royalty amount that I like to aim for. Um, and so sometimes that needle moves a little bit depending on what I'm spending on ads. Um, okay. Yeah. So I'll sit down, I'll look at my, I'll look at my income goal. I'll look at my ad spend and then I'll look at some marketing opportunities. I I'll talk in a little bit about like what, what might a marketing opportunity be when you're self-published. I answer emails. I listen to clubhouse. There's a ton of authors on clubhouse all day long, just talking about 
their process. I love it. I write, I revise, I have, a, I have an editor now that I pay. Um, and I still also swap work with other writers. So I'm still doing all the, the work of writing a lot like when I was in grad school. Um, but now I also have this extra step where I'm paying a freelance editor uh, to edit my books. Uh, and of course I read in the genre because I love that. So this is, this is kind of behind the scenes what is going on with my audiobooks? I, even though I pay a cover designer now, I don't pay them to adapt for the audio, which an audiobook cover is a different shape than an ebook cover. So you have to adjust the image, you have to adjust the topography, and I have to stick my name on there and the narrator's name. So I'll sit down and I'll adjust that. Um, and then this is like what it looks like when you're uploading the files. So this image up here in the left is ACX, which is, stands for Authors Exchange, I think. That's behind the scenes for Audible. So I would just upload that image when I finish working on it. And I, I have to upload all the audio files for each chapter as a separate file. It's huge amounts of data. The royalties are so low because it's just like a stunning amount of, it's just really large files. Um, in the lower right, this is what it looks like behind the scenes in a company find a way. They're like an aggregator. So I can use find a way to sell my book, audio books on places like Chirp or um, Spotify soon. I'm figuring out what it means to have audio books on Spotify. They'll, they'll put it on Hoopla or Overdrive. Um, I do all that inside find a way. And that's where I put all my metadata, which is a fun word that means like all the details about your book that help a computer understand your book. I think Kathy talked a little bit about BISEC codes maybe. Um, I Last week. Decide, yeah, I decide all of my own BISAC codes. So when I'm self-published, I can decide how I want my book to be categorized. If I want my book to be categorized as a gardening book, I can do that. Um, but gardening readers are not going, I'm not going to have good data if I do that. So selecting my BISAC code is like a really important thing. It's a really important part of the process. And I usually, you usually get to pick three BISAC codes for your book. So you can kind of see here, I don't know if you're able to see my cursor, but I can pick the primary BISEC and then I can select additional ones. So I can categorize my book. Once I purchase the ISBN, I put that in. Um, I decide the keywords that if somebody is searching the internet for, you know, romance book about sports, I can decide what keywords I want to trigger my book to show up there. I get to pick all of that. And then find a way has this, this is, you can see they have like 44 different um, distributors and I can select which ones of them I want to sell my books at. And I usually pick all of them, except for Audible. I, I put things directly on there. But um, so that's kind of like what it looks like behind the scenes when you're actually uploading your finished product to put it up for sale. I see there are questions in the chat. I'm not able to access the chat and I will definitely answer questions at the end. Sorry, I'm just talking mostly to that's just me actually i told them to hold their questions oh, okay. till the end oh okay great um this is something that's really exciting for me this is what the so on the left you can see my e my email ser service i use mailer light uh and on the right so when i write my own book i am decide what I put after the end. And what I usually put is, hey, if you like this book, uh, click here, join my newsletter, and I'll write to you and tell you when I have a new book. And I have a separate link for each book. So whenever somebody clicks that link that, that they liked my book and they want to join my newsletter, I have all this information about them. And I tell which readers liked which books, and I can send them a custom message and I actually can set it up that my mailer service automatically sends these messages. So this is, you know, these are all the people who have, in, in the past year, 20,000 uh, people clicked that they liked various books of mine and wanted to hear more from me, which is, it's exciting, right? It's amazing. Um, and I can do all that because I understand how the data works because I took all these classes. Um, this is a collaboration. When I say marketing opportunities, this is what I mean. I meet these other authors. 14 of us decided to put together an anthology for Valentine's Day. It's romance, right? Like this is our Christmas. So we put together this anthology and we're all marketing it to our mailing lists. So the hope is that these other 13 people will have 
readers out there who want to read my book. Um, and then, so my book in the collection, it links them to some of my other titles. And then it says, you know, sign up for my newsletter. And that's how I can get their information. So at the time, um, I had 10 people who had downloaded the anthology and said they liked my book and wanted to hear more from me. So this is something I'm really pushing this month because it's a free anthology and we can set it free because we're self-published and we are in charge of all of that. Um, so that was a really cool um, example of a collaboration that I'm able to do because I'm meeting these other authors and I am, and I have access to all of the really cool parts of self-publishing, like the ability to tweak my back matter and use my own email software. Um, so I put together a list of resources if someone was interested in learning more about self-publishing starting from zero. Um, these would be my advice. Uh, the first is the self-publishing formula. They have a, pod, a podcast and an open Facebook group that you can join. Uh, their podcast is amazing. It talks through step-by-step -step how to do so many different things, how to get reviewers, how to send advanced copies out, just everything. Um, the same it is for the Writing Gals. They have a show every week on YouTube about a different aspect of marketing. And they also have a Facebook group. There is an author named David Gochran. He's Irish. He writes fiction, but his nonfiction books are all about how to self-publish and more importantly, how to market your self-publishing, how to understand your audience, all of that stuff. Um, Klytics was the company I mentioned that you can go in and have them analyze the best sellers for you if you don't feel like you have time to look at the blurbs and covers of all the best sellers. Uh, and then I wanted to just recommend two craft books. One is called Romancing the Beat. So I think that this book might be valuable for people who write in other genres, but um, if you are ever interested in writing in romance, this, this book, Romancing the Beat, is so great. It sort of picks apart all the key elements of the structure of a romance novel. Um, really useful. And then I think all writers would benefit uh, from the emotional wound thesaurus. This is this amazing thesaurus where you can think, all right, what is wrong with this character? Oh, his mom abandoned him when he was little. And it goes through the psychology of what happens to people whose mom abandons them and how they might behave in certain scenarios and what situations might trigger them to act certain ways, like super valuable um, craft resource for developing characters. And that was, uh, that was all that I had. So cool. I, I'm very happy to take your questions and uh, thanks for being here and listening. That was so amazing. Like so informative. Thank you so much, Katie. Um, I need the emotional wound. <laughs> It is. I cannot stop reading it. I'm just like always saying I got it around December. I've just been studying people's emotional wounds. <laughs> I want to use it on on my exploit. You can do that too. Or you can help so, inform your characters. I can. I'll do that. I'll do that. Um, so I asked you all to kind of wait till the end. Um, now's the time that you can ask questions. Um, you can ask about anything pertaining to uh, her career that you're interested in. And if you want to, I mean, you can ask, uh, turn on your mic if you want to, or you can put it in the chat. Either one is fine. Yeah, I got I a make question. It. Sure. So in the romance industry, uh, is something that you have to battle with constantly, like being compared to like 50 shades of gray or something like that. And like, how do you take, how do you take that? Yeah. I've just learned to be really frank with people. Like romance gets a bad rap. People think that romance novels are not rich, complex stories, and they are, they just are. Um, I, I often ask people when is the last time that they've read a romance novel, um, especially ones that are written any time in the recent, in recent times, like they, they just, it's taking characters on a journey. It's showing people having like really complex scenarios and being vulnerable. So I, I usually just, you should just tell them that. I read romance novels as my, uh, like my treat, my treat to myself. I grew up reading romance novels. It was the only, the only place you could buy books where I grew up was at the grocery store. 
And so that's what they sell there. And um, they also, uh, that's what was available. That was all, that was all around me. So that's kind of what, how I got started as a reader actually was on romance novels. Um, do you have any, like, when does your journey begin in relation to the Fifty Shades of Grey phenomenon? Like you, mm -hmm. you started doing what you're doing after that, correct? Yeah, uh, I mean, of course I read Fifty Shades of Grey. I also read Twilight and hated it. Um, and so, <laughs> but I, I, I also loved reading it as much as I thought it was terrible. Um, I, I am a voracious reader. I, I kind of read everything. I'm really into fantasy right now. Um, but I, I started reading, I mean, I, what happened in 2015 is that my mother died and I was not able to read for a while after that. I just was not able to access that part of my brain. And then I was able to read Outlander, um, which I think of as a romance. The author does not, but, um, and I was just so excited to be reading again. I inhaled that whole eight, it was eight books at the time series in a, in a couple of weeks, um, and then I found that if I was sitting down and reading something where I was guaranteed that things were going to be okay in the end, um, that I could read again. So I was just really grateful for that genre for existing um, as a as a comforting yes source. Yeah, take the survey. I'm reminding everybody to make sure they take the survey. They have to to. Um, what did you guys think, um, especially those of you who are in my class and you know, you're thinking about the, um, the Friedman book and some of the things that Katie's talking about with regard to like what's all involved in writing and also marketing and selling one's own books. Um, do you see any uh, comparisons to what Katie was talking about and some of the other visits that we've had from other people talking about other aspects of publishing or anything you read? In the in the Friedman book. Hello. What is it like, Katie, to market not being one of I I, I created a uh, an assignment for my students that they have to do next week where they have to analyze the author platform of a writer. And some of those writers are Ball State faculty members, and some of them are just in, uh, other writers I know in the state of Indiana. And is it difficult? You know, the first thing I did when I became a writer was buy CappyDay.com. You know, mm -hmm. so like, what is that like? How hard is that to uh, to market when you're using a, a pen name, a pseudonym? Um. I don't view the pseudonym as being such an obstacle. I have penname.com. I have that and I have, I'm on the social media platforms as my pen name. Oh. Um, I'm terrible at uh, engaging with people on Facebook and I post stuff on Instagram. So I, I, I have all of the things where if somebody, I, I wanted somebody to be able to search for me as an author and, uh, and be able to reach me um ultimately and they can do that so i've focused up till now on growing my email list um but like i said for 2022 i'm going to learn more about social media and and grow my pen names presence on there um my students are also doing book they're learning how to do book reviews and really they're more like reader reviews, uh, I think is really what more of them are like, or blog reviews. And can you talk about like, what is your reaction to the reviews that you get? Do you have like good examples, like things that you're like, oh, I hate you. Who are you? And why did you write yeah. that? And why is that up there? What can I do about that? <laughs> the most the most annoying thing for me is a gushing three star. I'm like, come on, man, three stars. <laughs> this is like a glowing review. You couldn't, couldn't give me a four and a half. Um, so that's like the worst. I love it when I get a one star review and, and somebody's like, this book is so raunchy. I would never read something. I would never, I would never want to read a book about a character who behaves that way. And I use those in my, in my marketing copy. Um, <laughs> so the, the one stars are great. The five stars, I, you know, of, of course the five stars are great, but it's those three stars who, who, uh, who seem like they loved it, but just only gave out a three. And I always feel like they're so stingy. 
<laughs> do you, do you, I mean, do you read them like every day or do you have like a compartmentalized part of your day that you read them? I or? read them every day. I'm not supposed to, you're not, you know, it's not good for your, it's not good for yourself psychologically, but I, I do it anyway. Um, I, I see, see Sam in the chat has a question. I'm sitting here thinking every writer would love 70% royalties and fuller control to who would you recommend self-publishing or not is the risk only in learning and performing the labor and publishing marketing yourself. So I am a hustler. I said, I have earned a living as a writer since 2004. Much of that has been uh, as, as a freelancer. So I am accustomed to that. Um, I am used to the feast and famine. I I'm fortunate that I have a spouse. So we have, you know, some level of economic stability just from, from his, I, I carry our health insurance, but um, so I, I was not afraid of that element of self-publishing, but if somebody, no, nobody is going to work as hard for your books as you, nobody is going to market them as hard as you, nobody is, is going to feel and understand your characters as well as you do. And I can't imagine ever trusting somebody to like sit and study advertising data the way that I do for my books. Um, but I also, I know about my personality that I, like I said, I thrive uh, with control. So um, I would say that for me as a traditionally published author, that has been the most difficult thing about that experience is, is losing that control. Like you write this thing that you love and then you give it to these people. And it's like, Ah, and it, and sometimes you feel like they're not really giving it their best and it, it can be very, um, it can be very frustrating. Um, so I would say like, yeah, if you know that you're a control freak, um, self-publishing might actually be <laughs> a healthier, a psychologically healthier way to go. Um, yeah. do you, uh, think that, um, I mean, can you think of anything else to answer Sam's question about like, um, who yeah, else I mean, do you think? I, I, I want to emphasize the amount of time it takes to do that stuff, which I think might also address Kayla's question a little bit. Um, Kayla's asking about, you know, the technology of it all. So if you can do a blog post, you can do the technology side of it. Like it's all drag and drop, point and click, et cetera, et cetera. Now the, the photo the photo software is a whole different thing, but you can pay a graphic designer to do all that. And I, I pay a very expensive graphic designer, but you can, when you're starting out, you can pay a perfectly fine graphic designer um, who doesn't cost as much to do your ad copy and your, and you can say, Hey, I want it as an ebook, a paperback cover. And I would like the audio back, uh, uh, audio book side. So the, the tricky stuff you can outsource, um, where was I going with that? Oh, the amount of time that it takes with, with the marketing and all of that. I only write for maybe two or three hours a day. Um, and I can only do that when my kids are in school. I, I, I'm actually a little bit worried. I have three sons and Lord even knows what they're doing downstairs right now. <laughs> oh, I am having this conversation, but, um, so I, the, the majority of my work day is spent on the, the business side of it. So that is something to consider. Um, with the, but it, I, it's, it's possible to make a living doing this. Somebody, uh, Rebecca asks other genres like fantasy. Yeah. Fantasy writers self-publish all the time. Um, what's her name? Jennifer Armentrout. She did the, the fantasy series, the, from blood and ash, like that whole series. She's, she's a self-published author. Um, there's Lindsay Broker is a, a fantasy author who's self-published and does great. There's, there's a lot of people in, other genres um, who are doing very I, well. So one thing I would say is like, I don't think that the stuff I write would actually do well uh, self-published because you really do need to be writing in popular genres, you know, genres that people like, um, like devour. People don't devour books like the ones I write. And I don't think that, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong, but I do think that if you want to try to make money from it, it, it does need to be in something that people uh, 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 buy in large quantities and romance is one of those genres. And also women are the largest buyers of books in America or in the world. Mm -hmm. And so um, that's another, um, uh, another thing to consider is like, who would be buying this? Are they the type that would 
would want to be searching online for the next the next thing that they're going to read in that genre and um that's up for you that you know that's for you to decide yeah. kylie i'll let this be the last question kylie at, up at the top there said what would you recommend to someone who doesn't want to use a pen name but wants to write romance and just use your name use yeah. your name mm -hmm. Um, I think I think Lucy Score. I'm pretty sure that's her real name because um, she talks all the time about her siblings and stuff, and they all have that same last name. Like there's there's people who use their own name. Um, do you think like, that if you do you think that it was the fact that you had a quote real job and you were working at a university and some of those things that kept you from using your own name initially? Yeah, I mean, I was doing executive communications at the at the university. Like I I really had to. I had to be somebody who, if they Googled, I had to, I had to be aware of that sort of persona. Um, and Lucy Score does talk pretty openly about how she did get fired from her day job. Um, <gasps> when she published her first, her first uh, romance novel. And it's just, so I, I don't know if she would have been fired if she wrote in horror or mystery. Um, I don't, I don't know, but yeah, you could all, mm. I I sometimes get inappropriate fan mail that makes me feel grateful that I have a pen name. I have a there are laws about e email marketing. You have to put an address down. So I purchased a PO box in Seattle. So um, I put that address on it. Um, I never get mail there. I um, but like mm -hmm. there, of course, when I buy my ISBNs, I have to use my real name and my real tax information. So. If you know how to search those kinds of things, like you can find my house. Um, but it, as possible as it is, I, I like having the buffer of the pen name, um, mm -hmm. just because of like house plant guy and the inappropriate emails, which I'm sure you would get inappropriate emails no matter what types of things you write. When yeah. I was writing, like I used my own name to write parenting articles. I wrote. 13 years ago, I wrote an article for Parents Magazine about how I don't think that you should spank your kids. And I still, I still get horrified emails from people who really, really want me to spank my kids. Like, mm -hmm. and those come to my real name. So <laughs> yeah. Um, and then there's the whole issue of like women on the internet and how they get treated uh, sometimes. And that's something to think about as well. Um, so Katie, this has been, I want you to stay um, on here for just a second so I can say goodbye to you, but I want to say to my students that uh, thank you for listening and paying attention to um, my wonderful former student, Katie, and um, I will see you on Wednesday for our next co-working session, and then we'll come back. I'll see you in person Monday, the 14th, Valentine's Day. Yay! My, my Christmas. Christmas. My, <laughs> yes. Your Christmas, and um, I'll see you Monday the 14th, and then we'll be back on here on the 16th for Angela Jackson Brown and Sarah Hollowell. So thanks all for being here, and um, see you next week. Goodbye.